as Chris said, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, I work in Cambridge across all eight university museums and botanic garden, but I am underneath, deep down, there is a paleontologist in there. It's quite deeply buried, um, but for five years I was curator of invertebrate paleontology at the National Museum of Scotland, and I worked in the Cedric Museum in Cambridge for many years as well. Um, so, but I haven't worked on fossils for quite a long time. I work across a suite of museums. I'm based in the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is an art and antiquities museum. I work on a day-to-day -day basis with art historians, um, Egyptologists, but also anthropologists, uh, you know, people from a wide variety of museums. So, I mean, I, immediately I'm feeling the paleo love by being in a room with you guys. It's not often I'm in the room with so many beards as well, and that's no disrespect to all the women here too, it's great. Um, but, so it's, it, it's, it's really good to be here. I have to say also, when I volunteered to give this talk, I hadn't really sort of registered in my mind that actually on Friday I'm actually leaving my job. I've been there for 12 years. So it's been a bit of a mad week. So I'm sorry the slides might be a little bit haphazard. I also knew that I was going to be following Mark and he'd have lots of cool slides with sort of funny creatures in it as well. So quite late last night I've, <laughs> I've gratuitously put in some pictures of my dog to jolly us along a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry. And that's because I'm going to talk about cultural policy. And like you're thinking, oh my God, what she comes to talk about? This is what happens when you leave paleontology. Um, but actually, it's really important because it's cultural policy. It's, that's what makes funds what we do, in museums particularly. We, we need to engage with it. Um, well, unless you've got shed loads of money or unless you've you know, got some sort of hotline to some Theresa magic money tree. I don't know. So I'm going to talk a bit about cultural policy. I'm going to talk specifically about cultural policy in museums and the museums in England. And I'm so sorry if that's a little bit parochial for some of you. But I also hope that some of the things that I'm going to say actually help you think a bit about you know, what it is and why we do it. And so Mark is sort of quite helpfully asking, sort of you know, challenging us to think about um, that sort of so what about paleontology. And, and in one sense, I'd like to sort of take that almost that optimistic side. It's like, suppose you can answer that so what. You know, us in this room, we know that paleo is really brilliant. What we actually we're trying to do is all those people out there is like how do we engage them and I suppose I'm starting from that point um, I should also say I'm really really interested in audiences and we do a lot of work um, in my role about um, audience research and um, understanding who our audiences are and that sort of multi-dimensionality of audiences um, so that I might sort of touch on that a bit um, as I talk uh, and I'll sort of come to a bit of research in a moment so um, I suppose that question is what are we here to do? What are we here to do is engage people with paleontology. And I think a lot of the context in which a lot of us do that is um, it's, in a, it's in a framework of learning. Um, it's about imparting knowledge, it's about imparting skills um, in identification, but it's, that, it's, it's very much a learning framework. If you're doing science engagement, that's about learning, about knowledge transfer. Um, if you're in museums, it's about, so it's certainly, you know, previously, my background in, in sort of paleo engagement and, you know, running fossil days and stuff with kids is about learning. And I think that's been, in the past, oh, there we go, oh, um, I might have accelerated on a little sooner to that one, but learning has been quite important in museums. In, in, in 2008, and this actually comes out of, dare I say it, Tony Blair's, um, speech in 2002 when he talked about um, education, education, education. It was all about, his government was all about learning. Um, and out of that sort of public policy was all about learning. And I think that's something that we can feel quite comfortable in. So Inspiring Learning for All was a framework that the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council adopted in 2008. Um, it, there's various sort of funny little diagrams, but why I've put that up there, they've got a really long definition of learning. Um, but what is interesting is that De that definition of learning is really multifaceted. It's not like, I know something you don't, I'm telling you it. It's all about learning has this idea, that's what these, these points here, ignore the bit in the middle, is about knowledge and understanding, it's about imparting skills, it's about imparting changes in behaviour and progression, what do people do as a result of what they've, they've, they've got from you. It's about perish the thought, in enjoyment, inspiration and creativity, and it's about attitudes and values. So it's about that idea that what we can do with our knowledge of paleontology actually changes people. It's about the outcomes. And I think that's, and that's why it says generic learning outcomes here. I think that's 
that's really helpful to sort of think about the outcomes. Um, however, what, how am I advancing here? Just on that one. Oh, yes, there's the dog. Just because this is where I'm going to sort of talk about policy a bit more now. Okay. <laughs> so, just to sort of, I want you to go away feeling, oh, cultural policy is warm and lovely and sweet and stuff. Um, I'm sorry if you don't like dogs. <laughs> sorry, if you leave, you leave the room. Okay. Um, so, in 2012, yes, exactly. That's why I gave you the dog. Okay. <laughs> so, in 2012, um, uh, Jeremy Hunt disbanded the. Um, Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, it's one of those arm's length bodies they'd had enough of and it was pretty useless. And um, non-national funding for museums was transferred over to the Arts Council. And we all went, oh, okay. Um, quite challenging for paleontologists, I'd say. Um, and of course the Arts Council's sort of mission is great art for everyone. Um, and we sort of sucked our teeth and... I'm funded by the Arts Council, so I have to sort of, you know, get my head around this. And that's partly why I'm sort of here, is to tell you, you know, is to help you sort of understand that. So, um, so obviously the Arts Council, you know, they'd been happily funding theatres and dance groups and <coughs> galleries and stuff. And now all of a sudden they had a whole load of museums in their portfolio. And they sort of went into a bit of a huddle, um, because obviously great art for everyone's not going to work, is it? And they came out with great art and culture for everyone. Fantastic. Um, now, I could... Oh, God, we could talk for ages about culture, couldn't we? About it, what is culture and stuff like that. But that was their sort of concession to saying, well, we've got museums in our portfolio. We've got art and we've got museums and they're doing culture. Um, however, how are you comfortable you feel with that? I don't know. Um, I think it's also worth just to do a little sort of speculation. Great paleontology, everyone, what does that mean? Um, I mean, I don't think any of you here would doubt great paleontology for everyone, but actually what does it mean? I mean really, it doesn't tell us anything as a mission statement. But the reason I'm putting that up is because there's been a shift, there's been a really important shift away from that idea about learning and about outcomes. What do we do in museums? What's the impact and the outcome for people? This is, the Arts Council, have sh their policy has shifted and it's about the quality of what we do. It's not about the outcomes for the audiences. And I think that's sort of quite important. Um, that actually if you read, which you probably won't have to, a lot of Arts Council policy documents, it doesn't talk about learning anywhere. It talks about excellence. It talks about great art and culture. Um, it talks about, you know, what we are doing to, doing to other people is, has to be of a high quality. And I don't think we doubt that, but I think it's very interesting in that shift. Um, I think the other thing that the Arts Council is very strong on is actually who, are the, who is the everyone? And everyone isn't a one-dimensional thing. There are lots, uh, huge barriers that prevent people from engaging with museums, with art, with paleontology. And it's recognising that actually there's a lot more that we need to do to engage people. So, there we go. <laughs> Doing well so far. That was the other morning. It's very nice where we were. Um, and I was having a little walk trying to think about what I was going to say to you guys. Um, Okay, oh, we might come back to that in a moment. Um, <laughs> just let you in gently. I'm sorry, because I'm not quite as sort of tight as I might have been on the, on the preparation. Um, so we talked I talked about um, great art for everyone, great art and culture for everyone. Um, I'm touched that you're taking a photograph of him. <laughs> none of, none of <laughs> um, uh, when you look at how the Arts Council is mentioning learning, the only place it mentions this is in terms of children and young people. And of course this is a sort of a theme that we're quite, you know, we're quite exercised by here. Um, and, you know, Chris, you mentioned about sort of children and stuff, um, children uh, being at that sort of the, the sort of key target audience. So the Arts Council understand that learning is important in museums, but it's putting it very much in the domain of children and young people. So the whole idea of lifelong learning, the whole idea of sort of that broad impact of learning, broad life changes of learning, is not really there at all. And, well, that's interesting it because that's when we think anyway about this whole idea of gateways. And I have to say, I use the term gateway for paleontology. I don't use gateway drug, but I'm quite excited about using that in the future. So this is a piece of research which um, we've been doing in the uni university museums. Because I have, I don't know if you can see it at the back, but the colours maybe, sort of uh, the depth of colours. Because I've got eight museums and a botanic garden, I can do some quite interesting visitor research around sort of comparing the nature of the visitors in each of the museums. So along the top, I've given you a sort of indication of what the museums are. Um, the Cedric Museum is the Earth Sciences, is the Paleo Museum, often known as the Dinosaur Museum. And this is one of the um, questions that we ask people. Some of you may have seen this before, but 
at Natska, but there's more data in it this time. Um, interestingly enough, I had a little, a little dream about the sort of the, thank you, the, um, the error bars on this last night. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, um, I haven't been able to go off and check them. Um, so when we ask our visitors, why do they come here? Why do they come into, into that particular museum? What I think is really, really interesting is here. This is the Cedric Museum of Earth Sciences. This is the one with the big dinosaur in it. Um, 23, t more than twice, well, no, not quite, twice, all the other museums, our, our visitors are saying, I brought, I brought the kids here. The kids wanted to come here, which is a really high sort of motivational <coughs> factor. Not many museums manage that. Um, I wanted to bring my kids here. Oh, the kids really like it. So, you know, the Sedgwick, the fossil collections are deeply appealing. When we look at um, learning related, adult learning, people saying things like, I came here because I wanted to learn something. You know, there's a much more sort of even spread. Um, obviously, when you get to the history of Museum of the History of Science, lots of people are coming to learn something. You know, perhaps that says something about the collections. They're not necessarily coming for enjoyment and inspiration. Um, no disrespect to historians <laughs> of science. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll come back to that because I think there's, there's sort of other things to say. But I think this whole idea of, you know, this, uh, that, that people, our audiences, are seeing the museum as a place they want to bring their kids. Now that, of course, I think that amplifies so that not only that is the Arts Council is seeing learning as something that kids do. With something that learning is something that we quite feel quite comfortable around paleontology. Um, I think those sorts of things are amplifying um, a, a, you know, that amplifying how we, how we sort of look at what our subject is. And I think that's sort of quite a challenge. One of the things I'm quite interested in is, as a paleontologist, it's actually making sure that paleontology has a voice in this landscape of culture. Um, that we've been sort of lumped into this sort of culture, culture by, by the Arts Council. And they sort of, I have to, you know, we have to pull them up quite a lot and sort of say, well, what about science collections? And it's not just paleontology. What about science collections? Indeed, what about social history collections? Because they don't quite fit. And I think it's really important to understand the sort of the, the, the drivers that are going on so that actually we can make that case. And if you're thinking, why on earth? This is really important for having that, that sort of that, that role in, 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 in the museum sector. So Arts Council probably in the next four years will put... 92 million quid into museums that have paleontology collections in the national portfolio. They'll put more money to into smaller museums who they fund the museum's development program. So it is a really important um, thing to be thinking about. Is how can we have that sort of strong identity for paleo in there? So let's see what comes along next. That's the other thing. Does this look familiar to any of you? No? Yes? No? No. Okay. So museums have moved away from being learning organisations. That in, and that's a sort of, you know, that's a sort of general policy shift. So the thing I showed you at the beginning around the sort of the broad de definition of learning, um, Tony Blair's education, 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 museums playing a role in that. Cultural policy around museums now is absolutely about the social impact. Um, so if you, this is from the Museums Association, Museums Ch Change Lives campaign. Um, it's really widely um, sort of distributed. If you read that, there's nothing about learning in there. There's lots about enrichment. Have a look at that and sort of think, well, where does paleo fit? What am I doing that does that? And I think that's quite a challenging thing. I mean, absolutely, we enrich people's lives. Um, how do we contribute to strong and resilient communities? Um, how do we create a fair and just society? Um, those are th that's a quite a challenging sort of thing to think about. And I haven't, I mean, this is a provocation. I haven't got an answer to that. But I think it's really important to be aware that the context in which we're working that's what's going on that's where the funding goes for a lot of the work I do um, we get funding from Cambridge City Council on top of our Arts Council money which um, funds work um, mainly with kids but also with adults as well which is around breaking down so Cambridge has Cambridge has an image of being a sort of nice middle class well educated city it has got that it's actually also got um, extreme pockets of deprivation which are very much hidden but small ones both in the city and in the north of the county, in the Fenland, sort of rural, isolated populations. But there's also incredibly poor social mobility. So there's lots of middle-class academic kids, you know, doing really well. But there's also lots of kids doing really, really badly. Um, and the funding that we have from the city council is absolutely about that. It's not about them whether they want to learn about paleontology or anything else. It's actually about what can our museums do 
to help shift those kids', that kids aspirations and op life opportunities. Now, what's great is that we engage them with a whole load of subjects, including paleontology, and we take stuff out to the schools um, and we take stuff out to community centres um, so that we can do that. But that's part of an enrichment <coughs> programme. It's not necessarily for the sake of what it is paleontology. I find that quite challenging, but I also think it's important. So I suppose my challenge to you... Oh, quick, nice, relaxing picture of the dog, because we're nearly there. This just give me five minutes. Um, we're nearly there. I'm just bringing this back again, because, you know, it's a bit of data. I might as well flog it a bit. Um, what can we do to be pushing, to be upping in our fossil museums? And this is, you know, this is Cambridge, but this could be any fossil collection. And, um, what can we do to be thinking about how our museums can offer opportunities for reflection, for inspiration? Interestingly, for spending f time with friends and family, uh, you know, I, th I think we probably do that anyway. But what can we be doing to sort of broaden the reach of what we do? And perhaps to sort of explore that sort of lifelong learning, not in using that language, but actually thinking about, you know, what is it that we do that is more than just, just um, uh, working with kids um, and, and sort of um, and, and driving that. I, I will say the whole gateway idea, you know, because I work across all museums, it's hugely important to me, if I can get kids into the Sedgwick Museum, I can shove a leaflet in their hand or I can talk to their parents and then they can, we can, you know, if you like, we can wind them over to, um, to sort of the world of museum visiting. So I, it's quite a double-edged sword to me, you know, it's, it's actually really helpful that, we, that the Sedgwick is a, is a gateway museum, but it's also, I feel like we're sort of rather sort of st stuck and characterised by that. So finally, um, those of you who read Nina Simon, The Art of Relevance, um, I'm going to throw this one into you and think about um, because I think this is, this is sort of the, the challenge that we need to think about and actually it sort of comes back in a way, it's another way of looking at what Mark was saying. Um, it's that relevance. The way Nina um, talks about relevance is we know that there's a room that's full of amazing possibilities. In our case, it's this, this, this amazing world of paleontology. What our job is to do is help people unlock that door by providing things that are relevant to them. And I think that's the challenge to us. It's quite easy for us to find, relatively easy to find ways of making our subject relevant to kids. And dinosaurs are great for doing that. Invertebrates are too as well, let me say. Um, but actually, how can we do that with much broader audiences? How can we do that with people who really don't give a toss about fossils? And so, so that's my challenge to you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>